Carmen, why don't you introduce yourself, please? Hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Carmen, and I am the Safe and Healthy uh, Flex Program Coordinator for Revitalize CDC. Thanks, Carmen. <laughs> Rachel. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Rachel Monroe. I'm the Program Coordinator and Healthy Homes Assessor at Revitalize CDC. And Ethel. Good morning. I'm Ethel Griffin. I'm the Director of Programs uh, for Revitalize CDC. And then we've got David Kelly uh, under the assumed name of Colleen Loveless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get to introduce myself. Wow. All right, cool. I'm David Kelly. I'm uh, with Tactical Pest Solutions. I provide uh, the pest management services for Revitalize CDC. Thank you. And then we have Kara. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Kara, and I am the COVID-19 Program Coordinator at Revitalize. And CJ? Good morning, everybody. I'm CJ Hanley from CET. I act as the Healthy Homes Evaluator for Revitalize, and I also do um, energy assessments as well. Okay. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have Michelle Roberson. Um, I think she's unable to um, unmute herself, but she is the care coordinator, community health worker at Mason Square, Bay State Mason Square. So welcome, Michelle. If you're unable to unmute, pipe, feel free to join in. Okay, next I have on my screen, Hank, Hank Henry Douglas, Hank. Do you wanna introduce yourself, Hank? says he can unmute in the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Sorry about that. So we have Hank Douglas. He's the community health worker at, uh, Carmen, do you know where, what center he's at? Uh, Mason Square, I believe. Is it Mason Square? Okay. Mason Square. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Carla Garcia. <clears throat> My name is Carla, um, community health worker at Bay State Medical Center. Thank you, Carla. Uh, we have next is Joel Chandler. Morning, Joel. I'm a community health worker at the Bay State Healthy Homes Asthma Program. Thank you, Joel. And lastly, I have uh, this name, Soliver, S. Oliver. Hi, I'm Sonia Oliver. Um, I'm a community health worker. Um, I work from um, Home Early Intervention Program. Okay, thank you. All right, okay. I think that's it. I think that's everybody. And um, if somebody joins, I'll uh, may, uh, just put it in the chat if I see see somebody pop up. So, so the floor is yours, Suzanne. I want to thank um, thank you so much for uh, you know working with us on this program. You were a great find. And uh, your wealth of information, and we're very eager to to hear your your share your experiences and your your expertise with with all of us because we're always more to learn, right? Yeah, yeah, and I'm so pleased that you all are here, especially David. Um, you know, chime in. There's a small enough group that um, you can unmute, and if you have a question, let's uh, discuss. And especially David, um, you know, I don't, I'm not. My boots aren't on the ground controlling pests. Um, I'm a consultant. So, you know, while I visit properties, I'm there for two days. So, David, it'd be awesome to hear uh, any of your opinions and uh, input on this. I'm going to sh share my screen. Okay. So uh, thank you, Colleen, for having me. It's a great opportunity to talk to people about pests. It's my, uh, you know, my, my passion. <laughs> um, so I, my biggest challenge might be to keep it, I'm gonna try to keep it to an hour. We left an hour and a half for questions, but um, I will do my best to uh, try to just to talk the basics. Um, my name is Susanna Reese. I work at Cornell University. I have a grant from HUD to provide technical assistance and training to HUD funded properties. But as it turns out, I do all sorts of talks and, and trainings for affordable housing properties. My main audience is usually um, public housing staff or Section 8 housing staff. So 
in my slides as I was adapting, you know, the slides for this audience, some I might have missed some of the slides that say staff. And when I'm talking about staff, I'm talking about the staff of multifamily housing. And I know that that's not what my audience is. So I forgive me if there I, I slipped and a few got left in there. And I understand that a lot of you are probably working in individual homes. And I work in a lot of high rise buildings and multifamily housing. So um, just take some of my uh, slides with a little grain of salt and understand that um, my normal audience is big high rise building, public housing. Uh, we are recording these sessions. So if you think this session was good, you can share this with colleagues and Colleen is going to uh, post that on the the website and you can also get a copy of the presentation. I'm going to share a PDF of the presentation with Colleen because some of the slides um, have a lot of words on them and I have a lot of information I want to share, but we're not going to be able to talk about it all. So you can refer back to the slides. I'm going to talk about cockroaches and rodents today. Usually when I do a training, these are hour, hour and a half presentations on their own. So I tried to distill it to the most important things that you guys would need to know as home visitors and community health workers. What are, you know, what, what do we need to know? The materials that you, that we put together through Stop Pests are all uh, researched evidence-based uh, information on integrated pest management and all the agencies you see on the screen helped contribute to developing the resources and the presentations. I may, you're gonna see pictures of products. I am not endorsing them. I'm simply using them to illustrate. So um, don't take my pictures as an endorsement. So at this point, I wanted to hear from you guys. What is your biggest concern, your biggest pest? What pest is your biggest concern? And Colleen has a, a poll that she's going to put up so you guys can tell me, you know, what, what are your biggest concerns and um, give you a chance. Colleen, can you pull up that poll? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to give you guys a chance to, hopefully everyone can see the poll, give you guys a chance to do that poll. And I'm going to answer that poll as well. Oh, I think all the polls are in one. Are they? Okay, so you can take a, 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 a moment they? to answer all the polls <laughs> and we will see the results when Colleen will show us the results. Um, so the first question is, what is your biggest uh, pest concern at work? How often do you see signs of cockroach infestations in the homes that you work in? And how often do you see signs of rodent infestations in the homes you work in? And the last question was actually for the end and that was, will today's training improve or change how you do your work? So you can skip, <laughs> ooh, looks yeah. like you have to hit something. Sorry about that, All right. my first poll. That's okay, oh. we're, we're <laughs> you're new to it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm, corrupting the results by answering the poll too. Mm -hmm. um, so hit submit uh, that last question. I guess you just uh, can fudge. We won't take the answers to that question seriously because we won't be able to get the results unless you hit submit. Um, and I wasn't able to moving. use it. Go ahead, Ethel. We hit, I hit submit, but it's not moving. I didn't see Ethel on that poll. <laughs> I'm gonna get you, Kelly. <laughs> Colleen Lovelace over there. <laughs> They'll be using my name in vain now. Um, and it's funny because I can't—I can't even uh, submit a poll at all because maybe because I created it. But anyway. Yeah, you're the host. You can't. Yeah, I'm submitting. I hit submit, but nothing moved. It's still there. All right. All right. Well, you know what. Mm -hmm. Write in your biggest pest concern in, in the chat, and then we'll, we'll return to that. Um, I'm just curious what you guys are most concerned with. I'm guessing a lot of you are concerned with bed bugs because that's the one that we're most afraid that we're going to bring home. Um, I'll tell you a little personal story right now, and then maybe David can help me with this. Um, right now on my desk, I have my cell phone set up with this image. I'm renting a house right now while I'm looking to buy a house, and it is an old, charming little farmhouse, but this is what the basement looks like. <laughs> and uh, so on my desk right now is my 
cell phone with a security camera with this view because there are rats in this basement. So this is um, a big confession. <laughs> they are extremely challenging, but I imagine a lot of the older houses in New England and Massachusetts, um, David, maybe you've been in a lot of basements like this. It's horrific. I was uh, home alone last night and I'm watching the Netflix show Haunting of Hill House. And it's very rare that I'm alone. There's four kids in my, in my life. So I'm watching this and then I hear something in the basement and it took all I had to go down and set up this camera um, in, in this creepy basement. So as you can see, there's a lot of cracks and crevices and this is a huge challenge. So my point is my biggest concern right now in my life is rats and who knew like I get to experience this uh, firsthand. Uh, it is not easy and we'll talk a little bit more about rats but um here's probably a basement that you guys have all seen especially david anybody else have a a pest uh, concern that they a pest confession <laughs> they want to share <laughs> and just interrupt for one second susanna so i've got the poll still open do i want to end the poll will you be able to oh yeah end the poll and see what it says see what see what happens okay so i can see the results but okay Oh, and does it say show results? There we go. Oh, okay. Ooh. So you guys surprised me. Cockroaches are your biggest concerns. Uh, uh, mice, mice. 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 Mice, mice. I'm sorry. I was. <laughs> <laughs> Tis the season. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, I'm happy to see that because honestly, a lot of times uh, bed bugs get a lot of attention, but um, we know that cockroaches and mice have far more health consequences. Okay, and how often have you seen signs of cockroaches sometimes, mice? The thing about those questions is you don't see them. So when I moved into my place, I went down in the basement and I said, oh my gosh, there are rat burrows. And I asked the previous tenant, do you know there's rats in the house? And she goes, oh, I've never seen them. <laughs> <laughs> so all these pests are active at night so we, we often don't see them but uh that's what i'm here today to talk about is what are the signs um and yeah well, okay that was our last one i'm gonna just close the poll and that was a fun experiment <laughs> sorry <laughs> for me too <laughs> We'll work on that. So I usually start, I'm usually in person when I do my trainings and I usually start with, well, how have you fought pests? And um, a lot of my audiences, they'll talk about, you know, their experiences, but, you know, more than half the time they say, I call my guy, I call David up and they want someone to come and spray and take care of their whole problem with a can of spray or they get the can of Raid and done and done, right? Um, Today, I'm going to challenge you to think about pest control a little bit differently and think about um, how we, even the terms that we use. So the previous picture, we think of exterminator. He comes in with a toxic spray and he sprays everything down and kills everything, right? Uh, we're trying to change the dynamic a little bit and call exterminators now pest management professionals. I call them pest control technicians. So trying to change the paradigm a little bit to think about pest control as more of like a problem solving or a, a management issue, not just something that we can solve with a simply with a can of spray or a backpack spray or, you know, calling the exterminator. And in this picture, we have uh, somebody from a pest control company, pest control technician, who is not carrying a, a can of spray or a, a sprayer, spray equipment. He's carrying a flashlight, looking for signs and looking for uh, the pest conducive conditions. What we really want to do when we're managing pests is look at what all pests need and try to limit them. Like a three-legged stool, all pests need food, water, and shelter. And if we take one of those away, we that three-legged stool can't stand. So that's the idea here we're, that we're talking about. If we can control uh, some of these conditions that cause pests, we can uh, prevent a lot of pest problems. So in a nutshell, that is IPM. We're trying to take away their food, uh, shelter, and water. Um, but the actual definition of IPM or integrated pest management is using multiple approaches to manage a pest with the most economical and least uh, harm to the pe people, places, and in the environment. 
So we're not saying no chemicals, no chemicals. We're saying uh, use multiple approaches to control the pests because chemicals alone won't work. So what does that mean? Some examples of, uh, of IPM methods would be sanitation. And that's what hopefully uh, the message that you could give some of the clients that you work with, um, that you have to eliminate the food source. We have to clean up the kitchen area. We have to reduce those hiding places. We can't have a lot of clutter. And I know this is a big challenge in most of the places that I work. And I can imagine in a lot of the homes that you see that that this is, this is a challenge. Um, exclusion, exclusion is keeping the pests out. And that's what I'm doing with my house right now is uh, fighting this incredible battle with this old stone foundation and putting in little bits of mesh and cement and trying to seal up the holes. But finding out where they're coming in is a big part of pest management. Then using traps for obviously for rodents, we want to use traps and sticky traps for cockroaches. And then finally, when we've done all this, then we want to use pesticides to complement the other methods. But just pest, jumping to pesticides first, um, isn't going to help. If I put rodenticide in my basement right now, yeah, maybe a couple would eat it and die, but they're just going to keep coming in. So I'm just going to be like a farmer harvesting <laughs> a few off the top. Um, so the IPM program life cycle looks something like this. Uh, IPM started in farms, but now when we've adapted it to work in buildings, we use this life cycle. We inspect and monitor. And you can think about this in terms of your own home. You're not doing this in your client's home, but you can keep your eyes out and inspect. Um, identifying the pest correctly. I worked at a, in a, at a farm once that um, I set out uh, mouse traps thinking we had mice and there was rats so I used the wrong tool and came to work the next day with a very angry rat with a head wound. <laughs> so <laughs> using the right tool for the right pest, identifying that correctly, that's part of what uh, David does and he can help you guys with that. Um, but also you know, identifying the bed bug, like the, the beetle that someone thinks is a bed bug um, before they overreact and light off you know, six bug bombs. And then we scale the response, one cockroach versus uh, thousands of cockroaches, take different controls, use multiple tools, as I mentioned, and evaluate the success and then keep on inspecting and monitoring. By evaluating success, I mean, did it work? Did we do something and then we still have, we still have a pest, then it didn't work and we have to try something else. When I talk with multifamily housing, I really stress that IPM controlling pests is teamwork. And this diagram doesn't refer to you guys a little bit, except maybe you fall into that resident support services circle. But the point is, everybody plays a role. We can't just call the exterminator. We can't just call the pest management professional, but the um, all these folks that work in and around properties have a, a role to play. And I understand that a lot of your clients have private homes and that uh, is a channel, another challenge. Okay. We're gonna skip that. That was our second poll. I wanted to know how often you see cockroach. So we're gonna talk about cockroaches quickly. What is a cockroach? Why are they health hazards? Where do they live and how to control them safely? The concern that we have in housing is mainly the German cockroach. Um, we certainly see in Massachusetts, I'm sure you're seeing uh, some of these other guys. Um, but the German cockroach is the, really the focus of my talk today because that's the one that really infests kitchens. You can see some, there's certainly other cockroaches that get in homes, but uh, the German cockroach is the bigger, uh, the biggest problem. David, would you, you agree with that, that in Massachusetts and in, in your, the homes that you work in, mainly Germans or are you see other? Prime, primarily German. Okay, thanks. Um, what is a cockroach? Well, uh, the cockroaches that are, are the problems for us are usually live where humans provide food and water. There are certainly cockroaches that live out in nature and don't even bother us, but the ones that are our, uh, cause problems for us really depend on us. They all lay multiple eggs and have many babies or nymphs, and the nymphs look like small adults. They're not like butterflies where they start off as a caterpillar, go into a pupa and come out as a beautiful cockroach. They all look kind of ugly from the time they're born to the time they die. Uh, and then the other thing that we touched on is they're active at night. So 
often we don't know we have a cockroach infestation until it gets really out of hand and they run out of hiding places and then we start seeing them during the day. So you have to know what the signs are um, and you have to really look for them uh, because they're not gonna come out and hold up a sign and, and let you know that they're here. Uh, should you step on that one cockroach that you see? Yes, <laughs> um, but it is true that those egg cases will stick to your shoes and uh, sure. always look at the bottom of your shoe after you step on a cockroach because the moms carry around that egg case with them. Yeah. So one cockroach in June has uh, lays a, a egg case and she's got 40 babies, then half of those are female. Well, in six months, that's 18,400 cockroaches. So it is worth it no matter, even if we feel like we're not doing a lot, even killing a few cockroaches does something. Uh, you guys are community health workers. I know you know this. They, cockroaches are health hazards. They make asthma worse in sensitive people. They cause asthma in preschool age children. They can cause and aggravate allergies. Um, I have become sensitized to cockroaches. So I'm around them a lot. And the more you are around them, the more you have an allergic response if you're sensitive to them. Uh, they can contaminate food and dishes and uh, counters. So the point here is, even if we've killed all the cockroaches, the dead cockroaches, the skins and the frass, which is a fancy word for cockroach poop, um, they all carry those allergens and the pathogens. So it's, it's important to clean them up. And the only thing you have to do is um, regular old soapy water or a cleaning uh, spray. Think about where cockroaches live. They go from, they like to be around water, food, and heat, and those two rooms are our bathrooms and our kitchens. Think about how they go back and forth between the bathroom. They could be in your bathroom garbage one day and then the next day in your, on your kitchen counter. So that's another way that they can, uh, to really gross you out, that's another way that they can uh, share germs. So as inspectors and as community health workers, you should really know uh, the signs of cockroaches. Well, of course, live cockroaches would tell us there's a cockroach infestation, but we're not always gonna see the live cockroaches. Often we see the dead cockroaches and their parts. The frass is the most common thing that we see. Um, and then the egg case, which is usually about the size of a pencil eraser, but here's a nice close up of a, a pretty egg case. So that diagram I showed in the beginning, this is our inspect and monitor and identify part of uh, controlling cockroaches. Here's some other signs. That's uh, a familiar sight to you guys, that frass, that's the cockroach gritty poop that's on the walls everywhere, um, or not on the walls everywhere, I'm sorry. This is the picture on the right. We moved a stove and this was the rest of the wall was nice white clean wall. We moved the stove and then wow. Um, the other picture on the bottom left is a drawer, pulling out a drawer, getting your head up in there and, and shining a flashlight. And that's where the, you'll see the frass. Uh, the picture on the top is um, holding a cockroach monitor with that mom cockroach holding her egg case. Like I, I mentioned, they carry around their egg cases. They kind of take care of their babies until they hatch. Uh, the picture in the middle is a cockroach nymph. So these are all signs that everyone should be looking for, but they're not always obvious. They hide, right? So where do they live? Um, here I am pulling back the cove base and the picture on the bottom shows you the cockroaches wedged in that tiny space. They like being in tight spaces with the tops and bottoms of their bodies uh, feeling secure with something between them, like something they like to be between things. So um, I really hate this cove base uh, stuff now because it's always comes loose. And uh, in a lot of cases, if you have cockroaches in a home, that's where they really enjoy being. So the point is, they're not always obvious. You do have to, to look around and find these places where there's food, water, warmth, and uh, these cracks and crevices. This apartment with the cove base was so infested, I was in the living room pulling back cove base and there were cockroaches. So they're not always just gonna be in the kitchen. They can spread further from the, from the kitchen. And here's one, residents and staff should report sightings. So that's one that I didn't take out. So when working in multifamily housing, we really, or if you work with renters, they should be able to report to their landlords that they have cockroaches and the landlord hopefully would take care of that um, or 
they, uh, you guys probably have David come in and, and take care of some of these cockroaches. But the point is when you see cockroaches, tell someone, don't just accept out oh, they're there. Cockroaches can eat anything, uh, crumbs, grease, trash, cardboard, glue. That helps us control them with baits because if they eat anything, they're gonna eat the bait, hopefully. Um, so when we blame residents and say, oh, this person is so filthy, that's why they have cockroaches. Well, I always like to think about my own home and could I eliminate every single crumb in my own home? No, I can't. Uh, one single drop of grease can feed 30 cockroaches in a day or one cockroach for 30 days. So uh, it's almost impossible to eliminate all their food. Not that I'm saying don't try, but um, it, it's... Uh, there are many situations where I've seen very clean apartments and well-kept apartments that still have cockroaches. Um, in the picture on the right, underneath the trash bag, people don't think about all these little places that they'd have to clean. Um, so when you do have cockroaches in a home, it's really important to share the message with the resident that it's all hands on deck. You don't have to thoroughly clean um, throughout your entire life, but when you have a cockroach infestation, you got to be as clean as, as possible. Same thing with rodents. Think about where they drink. Cockroaches can't live, I think it's three days without water. So if we can eliminate the water, we'd be doing great. Uh, but again, that's hard. Look at all the places where they might drink. Well, so we've discovered cockroaches in a home. Um, what do we do now? Uh, and everyone has a role is from my my normal presentation, and this is from my normal presentation where the resident staff and pest management professionals all have a role. But the point is here, everyone can help, everyone can lend a hand, and really um, we do need a professional to control cockroaches in most cases. So residents, what we want them to do is clean up the food, don't use sprays or bug bombs, observe and report if they have a landlord or if they can report to you guys, and if it's a home that uh, David could could work in. Uh, we want to encourage that reporting if, the, if at all possible. Um, sometimes landlords don't do anything. I work in public housing where they have to, so um, it's a little bit easier for me. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about in the last session, okay, what if the resident can't? What if they won't clean up? What if the landlord doesn't um, help them? What if, you know, we'll talk about some of those what ifs in the last session. Uh, this is, I left this in even though it says staff because I just wanted to highlight there are uh, uh, areas where we have to keep clean, uh, the garbage areas and uh, the door sweep picture was just to show these are the, some of the places if it's a, a building, a, uh, a managed building, a property man managed by a property management firm or a landlord that these are the areas where the property manager or the staff at the property should should be uh, maintaining the trash and the door sweeps. So where do we, the, the other thing we mentioned early on is exclusion is a really important tool for all pests. How do we keep them out? We gotta seal those cracks and crevices. Uh, this is uh, an attempt on the top to, they, they knew the cockroaches were coming in from under the sink and it looks like they put a sticky trap good try, but they use duct tape, not ideal. Uh, duct tape will come off and it won't uh, seal. So there's better ways to seal things up than, than duct tape, but this person had the right idea. They looked under the sink and I'll tell you nine times out of 10, when I go into a home uh, that has a cockroach infestation, the first place I look is under the sink. Uh, you've got the access to food and, and water, but the issue with under the sinks is they often have access to the wall void and that's where cockroaches or the cabinet voids and that's where cockroaches love to live. They like to hide near the kitchen. So that's the first place I look. Um, so you wanna, uh, the other, the picture on the bottom, I'm sorry, is uh, this, uh, the maintenance guys in this apartment were sealing behind all the counters so the cockroaches couldn't get behind the counter, behind the cabinets. So it's kind of hard to see, but that those are kitchen cabinets and they were doing a really nice job of trying to block those, um, those access points where the cockroaches could hide. So silicone cock, cock pipe collars or escutcheon plates, I'll show you a picture later, screens and door sweeps are really important. 
Okay, we're on to treatment. What works? You know, we've identified we have cockroaches. We've done some exclusion work. We've tried to limit the access to the home, uh, but we need some sort of treatment. Um, and here's where my scale the response and use multiple tools comes in. Um, so hopefully in most situations, um, I encourage uh, either the homeowner or the whoever's doing the managing the home or the property or the pest management professional should be using sticky trap monitors. I'm gonna show you that. Uh, we don't want anyone to apply pesticides except the professional. A lot of times you'll see people with that can of Raid under the sink and that's a really good opportunity for um, education that those things don't work and they kind of scatter the, the cockroaches. And if your professional's using baits, they can contaminate the baits. So we really, the message here is if you can encourage your clients not to use those sprays and uh, if there, it's possible to have a professional treat, that's the ideal situation. Um, if you, if it is, there is no uh, possibility of a professional coming in, then the vacuum and little bait stations, I'm not sure if I took that picture out of this presentation, but vacuuming and the bait stations that me or you could buy at the hardware store or at a box store um, are the second best. Uh, rather than using sprays and bug bombs. So we want our pest management professional to use the most effective prevention and control at the least risk to residents and staff and follow up within one to four weeks with an, another inspection and treatment. Pest problems are hardly ever taken care of in just one visit. So we have to have some follow up and the use of monitors to know, did we kill all the cockroaches? Are they still here? Monitors like the ones I'm showing you in the picture are little sticky traps. They can tell you if there's cockroaches under the sink 24 seven. An inspection, me looking under the sink is only gonna tell me what's happening at that moment. I can look for the frass, but sometimes you don't see it. But these guys are what um, every uh, cockroach infestation or every suspected cockroach infestation, this should be a part of the treatment. This tells us a lot. So here we have uh, six traps. Uh, the two on the left were placed in the kitchen. The one in the middle was placed in the bathroom and the three on the right were in the living room and bedrooms. You can see where the most of the cockroaches are. You can also look at that. Um, the one on the left has more cockroaches on the left side. So we know, okay, they're coming from that direction. What's over there? Oh, it's a cabinet void. That's where they're coming from. Uh, then they can also tell us how bad the infestation is, but also if we've eliminated the infestation, if we put the traps out after the treatment and we don't see any cockroaches on the traps for about two weeks, then we can say it's probably been eliminated. Wonderful. But without those, we don't know. So I've condensed a lot of slides uh, into one here because you guys are not the ones that are going to be doing the treatment, but you can advocate for good good treatment. Um, the baits are the most effective pesticide option. If you have a professional, if David maybe is using some sort of spray, that's fine, but they should be applying it um, in cracks and crevices, not just broadcasting spray, you know, as a barrier treatment or maybe as a preventative. We, we really advocate in integrated pest management to only apply sprays or chemicals when you see signs of cockroaches. A lot of buildings I work with do this calendar based spraying, whether or not there's cockroaches or not, they just come in once a month and they spray every apartment. So we're trying to change that and, and use more baits, which is means less pesticide exposure. So the gel baits take the pesticide directly to the cockroaches. A spray sprayed on the ground, um, maybe around the edge of your kitchen floor uh, or the back of your cabinets is only going to affect the cockroaches that happen to walk across that line of spray at uh, the, during the time that that spray is effective. Um, and there are certainly really good products that stay effective for a long time as far as sprays, but um, the gel baits are going to be fed on by the cockroaches. The cockroaches are gonna go back into their hiding spots. They're gonna poop, they're gonna die. And then all those little cockroaches, the babies that don't come out of the hiding places very much are gonna eat the dead bodies and the poop and they're gonna die themselves. So uh, for every one cockroach that 
takes the gel bait that that eats the gel bait out in the open we're killing several more cockroaches in hiding so that's why we're advocating for the gel baits um, and also obviously the less pesticide exposure roof you have children crawling around on the floor do you really want to be putting uh, pesticide sprays on the floor um, dusts are very effective um, I just heard a study that I thought was interesting that uh, um, they, they tested to see co what products cockroaches were resistant to. That means which products aren't really working on cockroaches anymore. They're not killing. And boric acid is one of the oldest pesticides we have for cockroaches and it still works. It's a stomach poison. So dusts are really valuable. They stay active. There's several types of dust. There's desiccant dust that dry out uh, pests and there's chemical dust. They can be applied in voids um, when there's a vacant um, home or or apartment. It could be uh, the dust can be injected into walls and in cabinet voids, and it stays as long as it stays dry. It stays effective, so they're really effective, but not to be applied by me or you. Um, I know a lot of people use boric acid, mix it with sugar, leave it on the counter. That's not terrible. But if we're like going to be puffing dust everywhere, you got to be concerned about uh, in inhalation and exposure. Nothing is completely safe, right? The other really effective product is the insect growth regulators that professionals have access to. We couldn't buy these products, but they work on insect hormones, not on our horm hormones. So they prevent the insect from growing to maturity. They can't reproduce. The problem is they're very safe for us, but they take a long time to work. So when a professional is using an insect growth re regulator, that's great. We want them to use those, but there is an education piece that has to happen that the person whose home it's being applied in has to understand it's going to take some time to work. It's going to take over a month. Um, I want to just point out the gel bait in the tube is what professionals use, but often uh, we get these little bait pucks. And while me or you could buy that and put a little bait puck in our own home, we can't go into somebody else's home and place a bait puck. That is the same as applying a chemical. And to apply a chemical in somebody else's home, you need a license. Some properties I've worked with have gotten away with this by having these bait pucks available and for the resident and if the resident you can give them to a resident and they can apply put it in their own home. But you're crossing the line when you take a bait puck and you're putting it in somebody's home. So again, the chemical treatment should probably be done by a professional, but when you are out of other options when that is not an option these bait pucks can be purchased at the hardware store. I think I drilled this home. These foggers and sprays are just not effective. They can um, mess up the baits. They can, uh, the cockroaches are resistant to them and they end up exposing us. These bug bombs put chemicals on every surface except where the cockroaches are. Remember we looked, we saw that they were way in the wall voids and in those cracks and crevices and those foggers, they just don't reach. You, you could kill some, but you know, they have to be out in the open and the pesticide has to hit them. All right, we're gonna skip that. Does anybody have any, I'm gonna talk about uh, rodents next, but uh, does anybody have any questions about cockroaches before I move on? Have I given you enough tools that you think next time you uh, encounter cockroaches in a client's home, you might have some good advice for them? There's a lot of good information here. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, Suzanne, if I could just piggyback uh, real quick on the, the harborage areas. A lot of the times yeah. they'll get into refrigerators. So that seal around the door and the hinges. So when Susanna talked about those cracks and crevices and she was uh, peeling back that, that uh, the sweep board, the wash, you know, where the mop board is in a uh, cracked, um, uh, tiles or anything like that. So in those homes, repairing that, taking a look at those things uh, and in appliances, right? I mean, a lot of times they're not that visible as, as Susanna stated, but even in refrigerators in that seal, I noticed that a lot. Yeah, I, I took a slide out that showed somebody inspecting that seal because think about it, that 
that have you ever felt that it's there's warmth there cockroaches like that warmth and there's food readily available we're always spilling food um, around the refrigerator uh, yeah it, appliances so when you're looking for cockroaches you got to think like a cockroach all these places that have food warmth and nice tight spaces okay um, rodents, the two rodents that we worry about most are in, especially in Massachusetts, I'd say it's the Norway rat. We only have Norway rats in the east. We can count ourselves lucky at least in California. They've got pack rats and roof rats. And uh, so we are dealing with the Norway rat, which is probably the worst rat to deal with though. Um, and then the house mouse and also deer mice. I put a, a, I'll show you the difference in a minute. Um, it's important to know the difference. Like what I'm dealing with, I'm, I'm clearly have rats because I've seen the burrows, but sometimes you don't know, is it rats? Is it mice? And you got to get a professional or you got to look at the feces. Mice uh, leave little uh, feces everywhere. Rats will tend to go in one spot. Um, and often you never see the actual rodent. So the poop is really the one thing that we <laughs> can use to identify. I know it's gross, mm -hmm. uh, but I have a feeling a lot of you guys doing home inspections um, are, are fairly used to this right now. Um, so we're gonna just quickly talk about what they eat, what they are, where they live, how to think like a rodent and what's the prevention and control uh, also known as ratones y ratas. Um, we have, while I'm thinking of it, we on the Stop Pest website, uh, because we have materials we distribute to HUD, almost everything is translated to Spanish, at least. I'm trying to work on some other language translations, but um, definitely check out the uh, the website and look, there, there are some really good materials in English and in Spanish for helping your clients understand. Uh, rodents violate housing programs and codes. Um, in HUD properties, you don't need to see the mouse. You just need to see a little hole or one, uh, one dropping and that is a violation. And most housing codes, it is the same, a dropping or chewable holes, one or more live rats or mice and other insects or vermin observed. So that I just took from a, um, a normal uh, city code. So what happens if you have a client that um, has an infestation, you're sure of it. This violate, if this is violating your uh, local codes, you can get a code enforcer involved if the, if it is a situation with a landlord that's not doing anything about that issue. Rodents are health hazards like cockroaches. They cause or aggravate asthma and allergies. Uh, mice are in a lot of studies are the number one cause of asthma in urban uh, children. So um, the rates of asthma among African-American and Latino kids are far higher than um, than white kids, but that could be because they're more, they're living in cities more, um, often living in high rises and multifamily housing, but uh, it's not to be overlooked that, that, you know, a lot of people just think, oh, mice are ubiquitous, they're everywhere. Uh, we shouldn't be complacent about them because of the, the asthma and allergy connection. They carry infectious diseases. What do we, we had a, a study not too long ago in New York City where they, the mice were carrying several diseases we didn't even think, you know, we had in New York City. Um, so they carry the infectious diseases, they can bite. This happens more than you would actually think. I did have a good friend who was actually bitten by a mouse that she scared as it was uh, crawling over her while she was sleeping. So this happens, <laughs> it's scary. Um, and rats too, rats are known to get in children's cribs. And if you keep a bottle with your child in, in the crib, this does happen. Um, they can contaminate and damage food and property. They chew wires and create fire hazards. I was on a webinar yesterday with Bobby Corrigan, who's a famous rodentologist. And he said, especially if you have gas, um, uh, propane, heat or stoves. If you have rodents, this is a huge concern because they can chew, chew the wrong wire and that wire uh, lets off a spark and you have, you know, propane as your, as your uh, fuel, you can have an explosion. So this is not a joke, right? 
There's another figure that 20% of unexplained fires might be because of rodents chewing chewing wires. They chew the wires because they look like grass. And out in nature, a mouse would chew a piece of grass so it would fall over and they could access the seeds on top. Isn't that interesting? So there it's, it's instinctive for them. So where do we see, uh, where do we look for? We look for some of these uh, droppings, which you can see by the heat, the, the heater right there. I noticed there's mouse droppings right there. So I figured they were living in inside the heater and traveling from apartment to apartment through these little baseboard heaters. But look right next to the heater, right next to those uh, those mouse droppings is a crayon. So the kid was, the child in this apartment was playing right there and it, getting exposed to um, rat, uh, the mouse feces right there is not a good situation. Then I turned around and I looked on the table and I saw this inhaler and I thought, oh boy, <laughs> you know, they have asthma here too and a really heavy mouse infestation. So there's a good opportunity for education here when we, when we see clients and, uh, people with mouse infestations and children, we want to make sure that they're aware that, hey, these, these are big concerns. So what is a rodent? Uh, rodent uh, all rodents gnaw and chew to create holes and pathways. They chew through wood, plastic hoses, sheetrock, copper wires. They can, rats will even chew through cement. If they're really motivated, they can start gnawing on it. Uh, they're active at night. They all are active at night, mice, rats have lots of babies fast. That's what is the definition of a pest. I think uh, Bobby Corgan on my webinar yesterday said mice are the most, besides humans, second to humans, mice are the most successful mammal on the planet because of they have a lot of babies fast and they have colonized everywhere. The other thing to know that's common about rodents, rats and mice, is they travel the same paths along walls nightly. That is a big clue on how to, uh, that helps us um, control them. And we'll talk about that when we talk about trapping. Here is my picture of lots of babies fast. That's a mother deer mouse nursing babies that are almost the size of her. So they're uh, very good moms too. And it looks like they were nesting in somebody's uh, attic um, or their storage. So you got to expect that if you have a storage shed or an attic undisturbed, um, that's going to be a great place for mice and rats to colonize. So one mouse in one year, again, one mouse, pregnant mouse in January, she has, takes her uh, 20 days, she's pregnant for 20 days, she has a litter of 10 to 12 babies, well by December that could be 4,500 mice. Uh, so killing just that one mice and getting a hold of the mouse infestation early can really make a difference, set in one, a couple traps. Mice and rats are very different. Some similarities, uh, rats will be mostly outdoors. They come in, um, as I learned last night, they come in uh, um, for food and warmth. But if you trap them inside your house, like if I did exclusion and sealed up all the burrows and they were inside my house, they would do absolutely anything to get out, which means destroying your property. Um, mice are going to be mostly indoors. They can be curious, but they also are cautious. Bobby Corrigan yesterday said all mice and rats in the Northeast are developing behavioral resistance to traps. That's really a big challenge for us because um, traps are a nice non-toxic way to kill mice and rats, but um, he's noticing more and more trap avoidance. And it might be, uh, he, he's thinking it might be a behavior that is being, um, is evolving. Okay, so look how much food they eat. Wow, 0.5 to 2.5 ounces daily for rats, 0.1 ounce for mice. What makes no sense to me is how the heck do they poop so much if they're only eating 0.1 ounce of food a day? I have no idea how that works. Uh, mice rarely drink. Rats can have to drink water daily. So the problem is we can limit uh, the water for rats inside, but because they go outside too, there's a, uh, you know, that, that's a challenge. I always say that rats and uh, rats can get through a hole the size of a quarter, mice the size of a dime, but the babies are a lot smaller. They just have to get their head through and the rest of their bodies are really flexible. So um, think about the size gaps, about half inch to a quarter of an inch. We really um, wanna close those gaps up. 
Uh, rats can, will travel about 40, 150 feet from their burrows. Mice stay pretty close to their nests, so 10 to 30 feet. That's why if we see um, mice droppings, we know that, well, the, the nest has to be here 30, 10 to 30 feet, probably in your home. Okay, so the Norway rat, it's bigger than mice. Uh, obviously, that's a Kansas City rat. Um, the mice that I wanted to show you and talk to you about are the deer mouse and, um, or a field mouse and the house mouse. The reason I'm showing you this is um, house mouse, they're everywhere, they're gonna be inside. But when you catch a mouse and you see it's brown and with a white belly, you have mice coming in from outside. Um, most mice come in from outside, but this is a really good sign when you see that white belly that oh, they're actively coming in and I have to figure out where they're, where they're coming in because deer mice are generally outside and try to get in in the fall. So right now is when they're trying to get in. They're gonna circle buildings and they're gonna feel any um, warm draft of air or the scent of food. And they're gonna be like, oh, I wanna be in there. And then they're gonna start chewing to get in. Oh, you guys don't have these, sorry. So the signs of rodents that we look for. Uh, sightings, very rare because they're active at night. The noise in the walls, that's what I heard last night and it was disconcerting. Uh, gnaw marks, uh, holes, nests, rat burrows, droppings. If you have a cat or a dog, they often alert. My dogs did nothing last night. <laughs> uh, rub marks, I'm gonna show you. Indicator pests, that means if they're dying in the walls, you get flies and beetles and then the smell. So you gotta know the signs. Uh, mice droppings on the right, they poop as they go, they pee as they go. I have a, and I'm sure uh, David does too, I have a little um, uh, flashlight that uh, makes the, the urine fluoresce. So you can look at the trails, that's great with mice, but rats, um, this is a drop ceiling and you might look at a drop ceiling and see water damage and think you've got a leaky pipe. In this case, it was a rat infestation because rats will tend to go to the bathroom in one place. They're actually a little bit uh, cleaner than, you know, fastidious, I guess. Um, so anyway, that that is something to look for with these drop ceilings. That might not be a, um, a leaky pipe. Drop ceilings are a disaster because a lot of times um, when you doing rodent control, no one ever looks up there. And uh, that's often a place where they are running free. Holes and rub marks. So holes in the exterior of the building. This is really hard with older buildings. Uh, what I'm dealing with, this old farmhouse that has a stone foundation. I'm trying to find every one of these little holes. But um, these rub marks that I put the red arrow on are often an indication of, okay, this is a pathway that they're using pretty frequently. Their body oils leave this like gross smear on the, uh, on, uh, the walls and where they're normally um, traveling. They use their their uh, body smears, their body oils, their urine, their feces to send messages to their buddies like, hey, this is a great place. You've been here before. We, I've been here before. This is a great way to go. Try this. <laughs> so these are rat burrows. This is a picture I took in Rhode Island. Um, the uh, This is crazy amount of rat burrows. What do you think's on the other side of that fence? Chickens. Ah, that's funny you said that. <laughs> that's what um, I have chickens, so um, <laughs> just in the uh, thinking through my my issues right now. Uh, so garbage. So there, rats are always associated with um, with a food source, and if it's in the country. Yes, chickens, livestock, absolutely. But this was more of an urban setting in Providence and um, right there is the dumpster. So we had to talk about how we can seal this dumpster and this bait box was doing actually nothing because they had just this wonderful source of food from the dumpster. So when we have rodents now, what do we do? Well, there's no single answer. We wanna provide effective prevention and control that is compatible with people uh, pets and other control measures. We identify, we figure out where they're coming from, how many, that's often hard. I always say, if you think you have one mouse, you probably have six to 10. <laughs> um, is there an obvious food source taken? Is there something that we can clean up? Is um, there, what action did you take? And then 
have you followed up? So when I covered up the burrows, for example, I went back the next day to see if they were opened up again. When I sealed up uh, with concrete and mesh, I went back to see if that was still in place the next day. They had dug around it, but you got to always follow up and, and keep going and keep monitoring. Find out where they're getting in. They come in from the outside through utilities, pipes, and doors. This building that I inspected had a bad rat problem and we're going around the whole building and sure enough, the door, the back door that was closest to where their trash chute ended, their trash compactor room, was propped open. So we were letting the, the rats right in that doorway and have access to the food. So uh, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. Inside, they're going to use the appliances, the heaters, corners, and basements and closets to kind of hide and travel. Uh, and again, where have you seen them? If you see a mouse, you know that their nest is nearby. And again, how do they get in these holes through pipes and utilities? So when we have mice, um, you want to seal up all of these uh, from outside in. When you have rats, you want to go inside out. You want to start sealing the inside first so they can't access and can't get in. Um, the gaps, uh, check out your own door. Um, check out every single door of every home you visit. Uh, when I did a course called the Rodent Academy in New York City, <laughs> um, we went out on the streets and we looked at gaps under doors. And in New York City, the rest, you'd be surprised how many restaurants have a nice thick gap under their doorways and the rats and the mice are traveling along the edges of the building. They sense the warmth, they smell the food, they make a beeline under that door. So anytime we have uh, openings under doors and between doors, these are great places for them to come in. Uh, the company that is making some really fantastic uh, pest exclusion materials is called Excluder and that's just a example, um, but they are one of the only companies that makes these, these rodent proof door sweeps that have metal mesh inside because the rodents cannot chew through them. Um, so it's expensive, but sometimes worth it. But any door sweep will do, but just some are chewable. When they're inside, where are they going to live? Well, they're going to live in the furnace. They're going to live in the heaters. They're going to, they really love the warmth. Um, when you have a contractor that is coming in and put installing a furnace, look at the gap that they left. When you're working with contractors, it should be part of the contract to have them seal up whatever uh, openings they have made, they need to seal up and just make sure you're, you're, uh, you have some oversight on any kind of contract work that comes in because they won't seal up these holes uh, if they are not, if it's not part of the contract and, and they're not, it's not part of their job. Um, what else I want to say? Oh, the picture on the right with the uh, baseboard heater, that along the top is uh, just years and years of um, rodent urine accumulating and it's volatilizing every time that heater goes on and sending those mouse urine proteins into the air where we breathe them. And uh, look at that sad attempt at using a glue board. It's not even, it's not gonna do a single thing because the mice are traveling along the top of that, um, that uh, heater. Stoves are huge for me. Uh, when I go into a, a home that has a mouse infestation, I look under the sink, but also on, under that uh, top plate of the stove, I lift it up and look at that. They love living in stoves because they have all the food scraps they need. They've got the insulation in the side and they've got the warmth and they're usually pretty close to the sink for, for water. So those are two really gross pictures, but um, often when you, uh, uh, or in a unit, you won't see that unless you lift it up. So look at this picture on the left. I was in this guy's apartment and he was complaining about mice. I said, where'd you see them? And he said, near the stove. And either A, he was a very good housekeeper or he did not cook it very much. <laughs> but anyway, he kept it, the house, the whole house, was, the whole apartment was very clean. But when I look, lifted up the top of the stove, that is not food scraps. Those are all uh, mouse droppings. So the mice were living very happily in that stove. And that's somewhere everybody should um, definitely be inspecting when you uh, know that there are mice in a home. 
Uh, so I lift up that top plate and I pull out the bottom drawer and here's another stove that um, I pulled out the broiler drawer that was just used for storage. And look, this is a great sign of, of mice. This, the insulation is pulled out of the sides and they tried to make a little nest there. Sometimes you'll see heat damage on the cabinet directly next to the stove and that means the mice have pulled the insulation out of the stove and uh, that that's no longer you know insulating you know keeping the heat uh, from escaping um, so that's another sign but often it's just the the droppings that you see and my screen is cut off but I think you see there's another sticky trap doing nothing a, a, a glue board and then uh, they tried to use this foam that is supposed to be rodent proof. It's mint uh, flavored, but mice will chew through that that foam and they don't really, you know, maybe for a little while they'll be like, ew, mint, but after a while they'll get used to it and the smell fades and they're just gonna chew that up and use that as nesting material. So anything they can chew through, they will. So this person had the right idea. They knew the mice must be getting in around this, um, what is that, like an outlet or? whatever that is, um, but they didn't do a permanent fix. This is just a temporary fix to use the spray foam. So stoves are a big problem. When you ha find an infested stove, um, and again, this is from my normal class that I do for housing authority staff, I have to ask them, who's going to clean that out? You're going to hire a professional? Are you going to do it? Is the resident gonna do it? If the stove does not belong to the resident, it's part of the property, it's not really their job to clean that out. And uh, you know they need to keep it clean, but this is a job that is often really best left to a professional. Um, so I've seen professionals do this and they have to surround the whole uh, stove with sticky traps because once you start working and pull off the sides of the stove to pull out the nest, those mice might come running out. So you have to have some way to keep them from, you know, just hiding somewhere else. Um, and yeah, so when you do have an infested stove, it's got to be either cleaned out or replaced. So we use materials like again, this, the spray foam is not, not a good material to use. You want to use mouse proof uh, materials, rat proof materials that they can't chew through. This uh, stuff it stuff is copper mesh. You can take pieces of that and stuff it in places and then seal it with a caulk or a spackle. And then you wanna check those holes. Uh, so here's another picture of the stuff it. You can get these big long rolls of it or you can give your clients these little copper scrubbies. The reason we use copper instead of the steel wool uh, scrubbies is because they don't degrade as fast, they don't rust. The picture of the gas valve, it has an escutcheon plate around it, a pipe collar, and that is perfect. That is going to keep the mice from coming in right there. And then there's also excluder mesh too here. Sanitation is really important. So we've, we've, we've gone through the home and we've sealed up all those holes. And now we have to worry about, okay, what's left inside? Um, would a mouse eat this ugly bitter blue bait when they have this nice little hot dog dinner <laughs> ready and waiting for them on the stove? Probably not. So we need to eliminate other food. And like cockroaches, it's like an all hands on deck thing where if there's uh, an infestation, you might not be the cleanest person. I am definitely not the best housekeeper, but now that I know I have rodents, I am not leaving anything out at night for them. So keeping things sealed in containers, cleaning up food spills right away, washing the dishes and cooking utensils soon after use. This is hard stuff, I know. <laughs> I have kids, I have a job and you know, sometimes you're up really late doing the dishes from a big meal. It, it, it's a big ask, but um, it's, uh, it's gotta be done. Um, Keeping outside cooking areas and grills clean, no pet food or water bowls out overnight. If you can put those away at night, you're not feeding the rodents. Uh, using thick metal or plastic garbage cans with tight lids and keeping compost bins away from the home. I um, am currently, I used to compost. I am not composting anymore because of uh, my situation. So even clean units have their enticements get that food. This is a good example of the tray, kind of keeps the spilled food uh, and the water. 
off the floor and then that whole thing can be put away at night. So sharing good information with your residents, a lot of the fact sheets that extension and universities put out are look like the stuff on the right, which has a little too much information, uh, but it's good information. That's from uh, University of California. The I'm trying to use more picture-based materials to talk to residents. Uh, this is something I created on my website, which has picture-based, uh, this is a picture-based rodent control a handout that you can find at stoppest.org and I can share those links with you. Keeping the message simple and just to the basics. Trash and recycling, keep, uh, keep an eye on the situation wherever you're working. The trash shouldn't be overflowing the dumpsters, shouldn't be overflowing the garbage containers. Hopefully when there are dumpsters, a situation with dumpsters that they're free of holes, they're covered, they're closed, placed on concrete. Uh, you saw the rat burrows under the uh, around the bur the dumpster I showed earlier. We don't want those rat burrows under the dumpster. Um, the drain holes should be screened. Recycling and dumpsters emptied regularly. If they're overflowing, they're not getting emptied nor uh, regularly enough. And uh, yeah, keeping recycling bins clean and covered. Landscaping is important too. This is another thing I'm going to do at my house. I just ordered a big giant load of gravel to put around the entire ha uh, back of the house where there is no gravel. But this uh, picture right here shows no dirt right next to the building that would allow any critters to burrow in and dig under the foundation. Um, and this goes, this is true for mice. The more vegetation up close to a building, the more hiding spaces there's going to be. So, uh, you don't want to offer them more coverage than they need, and you don't want branches that are going to overhang or touch the building. That just gives them places, a little highway to get on. Traps are really effective. You know, you got the standard snap traps. The picture on the right top is a good nature. I can't remember the model number, but it's baited when it has a pressurized uh, it's pressurized, I'll just say, and then when the rodent sticks their head up into the trap mechanism to get the bait, it gets bonked in the head. Um, so that's something that's reusable. It's expensive, but for a heavy infestation, it might be worth it. Uh, but snap traps work just fine. Um, some are better than others. Uh, more are better. You want to check them often. Often, especially with rats, we leave them unset. You put the bait on them and you wait until the rodent is actively taking the bait from the trap before you set it so they get comfortable. This is especially important with rats because they are very cautious. They're not gonna approach anything new. They're way too smart. You put it up against the wall and then remember I told you they travel the same pathways every night. That's why you gotta observe and figure out where they're coming in, where they're coming out and that's where you place the traps. Ah, glue boards, um, you know, everybody has different experience with glue boards and someone I just recently spoke to caught two rats on a glue board, so I wouldn't rule them out, but just know that they're not going to solve the problem completely. If you put them out, put them where their regular runs are and know that mostly rats and mice are going to be too smart, but you will catch juveniles. So this was really sad. I pulled out that drawer under the stove and there's that little baby mouse still alive under the stove on a glue board. And that can be, um, you know, for someone like me, it was even hard to dispose of, but, you know, are we asking people too much by putting those out? Um, how will you dispose of that? what will you do and are you going to have a situation where one of your clients is touching a live rodent or get, maybe possibly getting bit what are they going to do with them anyway um think about before you use glue boards think about how to use them and effectively use them and this one my buddy uh sent to me this was a rat that was on a glue board and he peel chewed and peeled himself off sometimes they leave, even leave body parts behind it's really gross okay. Ultrasonic repellents, uh, everyone always asks me about these. Um, just don't, <laughs> that's my only bullet point, just don't. <laughs> uh, they don't really work. And, and when you're using them for something like mice, um, maybe in a confined space, but they're gonna, mice are gonna just like walk, change their path and walk up so they aren't uh, affected by them. So they're, they're gonna learn to, to deal with them like these birds have, um, 
have learned to deal with the sound and nested right on top of these repellers. So chemical use and rodenticide should be left to a professional, but certainly me or you could buy a rodenticide in the store and put it out. We want to put them out in locked boxes. We don't want any other critters or children or anybody else to be able to access the rodenticides. I will say that a professional is going to have much more powerful chemicals than me or you could buy at the store. And again, it's a job that I would highly recommend having a professional uh, handle and not having the average person deal with rodenticides. Thing with rodenticides is when I moved into my place, I noticed a ton of rodenticide in the basement. Did it work? Not at all. So you can't just put rodenticide down and expect the problem to go away. There will always be more mice, rats coming into your home. Um, you're just harvesting a few off the top. Um, let's see, they are a chemical and the label is the law. So anyone using rodenticide should be reading the label. Um, dry ice is another option that is only available to professionals. There's a label for it now with Bell Labs. You can buy dry ice and it can be put in uh, rat burrows. Uh, but again, that's a professional job. So do bait boxes work? I went to this building, it was really nice. The grounds were nice. The there was no trash around. There was a horrific mouse infestation inside. And the contractor that was working in this building was simply just putting around bait stations. And the point here is these bait stations give you a false sense of security. They may kill some rodents outside, but they're doing nothing for the rodents that are already inside the building. And do bait boxes work? Well, not if they're never maintained. It looks like the rodenticide in these bait stations was never touched. So if I was the professional and I checked the bait station and nothing had been eaten, I'd probably change the bait and try something else. But um, no one ever checked these and um, the mice or the rats, I'm not sure, just started living in the, the box. So they don't work if they're not checked. I'm not gonna go through this, but um, this is really important stuff. So uh, if you would like more details, I would say check out the CDC website. This is all from the CDC website, but there's some pathogens and icky, icky stuff in rodent droppings. And yesterday the webinar I was on said, don't even use an N95 mask. If you're cleaning up mouse or rat droppings, use a, a real respirator with HEPA filters. Um, this little N95 isn't gonna be enough even, so unfortunate, but... Um, that use latex gloves. And then the important thing is not to sweep up droppings, never sweep them up, never vacuum them up. Um, even with a HEPA filter, because you're still pushing them around and that's still gonna volatize and go into the air when they're dry, when the urine and the, the feces are dry. So what do you do? You have to wet it down first with a bleach solution or a, a, a disinfectant, leave it for five minutes, make sure it's thoroughly soaked, then wipe it up. So to review, sanitation, eliminate the food source, uh, exclusion as important as sanitation, traps, proper placement is critical, and rodenticides are our last resort and not highly effective without doing everything else. Um, you can feel free, this was gonna be our last poll question, but um, you can feel free to let us know <laughs> if you think that what you learned today will improve or change how you do your work. Uh, one last thing I want to mention before I take questions is uh, this is a small group. If you guys want to send me a photo, a video, or a question, we could feature uh, some of your issues in the last uh, session on November 4th if you're going to join us. So that's my email address. Feel free to send me something that you're having trouble with, even personally in your own home or something that you want to highlight, something good that you did, um, anything. You know, this is your chance to, to share. And finally, uh, this is my website, Stop Pests and Housing, and we've got recorded webinars, we've got pest solution page, I have a blog, um, but I think the most helpful section for you guys is this working with residents. You can take a look at some of the resources and like I mentioned, I recently put up those picture-based resources and I think that might be helpful ways to communicate with, with residents. Um, uh, this is my office phone, actually. So I'm not in the office every day anymore. So just feel free to email me and visit the website. And I apologize. I haven't looked at the time. I'm probably way over. It's uh, We have 10 minutes left. 
It's uh, 10 okay. 30, so I'm going to have nightmares, I think. <laughs> to wrap huh. all this. That was great information, though. Wow. <laughs> um, you did last night, I'll tell you. I watched, um, I, I, I shouldn't have, in my dreams, this horror, the haunting of Hill House, which I'm watching on Netflix, got <laughs> mixed up with my uh, rodent infestation, and I dreamt, you know, it, it was all... It was all crazy dreams last night. So yes, I'm sorry for all the nightmares I have caused. <laughs> David, do you want to add anything? No, I thought that was a uh, fantastic training. Uh, I think for, for our purposes too, well, for, for Revitalize, uh, differentiating between rat and mouse, because many of the clients will say they have rats. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if they, if they talk to uh, any staff members saying they have rats, I think, you know, it, getting this, um, this uh, slideshow out to show the droppings, to show the, uh, the differences will be key because when you tell a pest professional and, and identification, right? So Susanna talks about identification, proper identification determines proper approach. Mm -hmm. So it, this, was, this was fantastic training. Yeah. Oh, Thank thanks. You. Any questions, anybody for Susanna or David? Or CJ, you've got a wealth of experience. Do you want to share any information? Um, I I was curious about uh, the effectiveness of some of the like have a hard traps because um, I know some people, like you said, they don't like seeing dead mice, and some people don't mind at all. Um, but yeah, I was just curious. Um, I know people use peanut butter and. Um, I haven't had mice lately, but I saw one at a friend's house the other day and they didn't want to kill it. <laughs> so um, they don't have a big problem I, though. Some people just have a random one here and there. So mm, yes. in my experience, <laughs> if you see one mouse, you probably have a, a full family. Multiple. And if that mouse was yeah. a female, you know, it's best to get those traps out right away. So a mouse issue when it's early on i think is very possible for a person to handle without a professional you if you're using traps and you're using exclusion you can do it and you can share that with clients it's when the mice get you know really and when the infestation grows and they're in the walls and you know that that becomes a little more challenging the live traps are really valuable but if i would leave it to a professional because um what am i going to do with a a live trap um like they make little smaller traps not like the have a heart traps are you know bigger traps but they make small live traps for rodents and uh for for mice especially what do you do with those when you when you catch them most people just release them outside and those i guarantee are back, right back in your in. house <laughs> yeah. so if you want if someone is just wants to use the live trap then uh, you, a professional should do it because what is a professional going to do? They're going to kill those as humanely as possible um, from the live trap. The advantage of the live trap is they catch more than one mouse at, um, uh, you know, like a snap trap just catches one mouse and it's done. But a live trap can keep catching mice. David, what do you think? I agree. Uh, you know, again, with, with, with those have a hearts, you, you said it. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to release it back outside and, and it's coming right back in. So, uh, and, and the, the old wives tale, right, of mice who, you know, when it gets warm out, they leave your house. It's not mm -hmm. true. Once, once, they, once they're in your home and they have all the amenities of home, <laughs> they're not leaving for the summer. They're there. So it's uh, seeing one mouse, could a rogue mouse get, be in there? Yeah, it's, it's possible it could be a rogue. Uh, but, but as Susanna says, stated, if it's a female, you're having a family. Yeah. Yeah, I've been, I deal with bats a lot too, only because I, I, I inspect attics as well. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I see, you know, abundance of guano, which is also a health hazard uh, for people who go and work around it. Um, and it just interferes with, you know, and then it's hard to get rid of them. They're, they're very similar, you know, once they set up. I'm dealing with a woodpecker at my house. So that he's probably di digging for bugs in my siding or something. I can't oh, see scare him away. In its territory as well. I mean, there's multiple reasons as to why that's happening. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, but thank you for all the um, information. Um, I think a lot of my clients have neighbors that aren't keeping a clean house, too. 
And so, you know, they keep their home clean, but the mice are coming from the neighbors or cockroaches and such. Because um, not every client of mine has, has got a dirty house. It's their neighbors leave trash out and they can't control that. So right. it's a hard thing to deal with when neighbors are not on board. So you have to seal the penetrations between your home and theirs as best you can. And yes. well, that's where a lot of that IPM comes in, right? That integrated pest management, controlling the environment. Yeah. yeah. Such as the landscaping, as Susanna stated, and looking for those openings, uh, you know, and the whole size of a dime, right? How to locate all of that. It's, it's next to impossible, but doing the best you can to exclude what you do see. Um, you know, I, 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 well, I just want to go back to the bats. That's a professional job because bats carry rabies. I wouldn't, I, I don't generally give recommendations on bats except, um, you know, sometimes there's a rogue bat flying around. It gets in the house, open up the windows, and it will find its way out, open up some a door. But if you have a colony and you're seeing guano, that's serious. That's a very a big health concern. And uh, it, it's hard to handle on your own uh, to take the correct precautions. But often um, if you know where the bats are coming in uh, and they have no babies, there's a certain time of year where they have babies. And if you close up <laughs> where they're coming in those babies are going to die and it's going to be a disgusting mess in your attic um so a professional is going to figure out where they're coming in and, and a homeowner could do this too or a, a, a renter um but you can figure out where they're coming in and close that off yeah. and again it's a tiny tiny hole that they're going to be coming in and i know when my parents had bats they stood out they were tired they hung out and had a beer every night outside the house and just watched the house to figure out where the bats were coming in and out. And then yeah. they called the contractor and said, the, close that hole. Yeah. <laughs> That's when you called Dave. Up, <laughs> right, right. So bats are serious. Yeah. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention, no, I, I don't know if anyone uh, wants to ask about it, but nobody brought up repellents. And a lot of people like think mm -hmm. that like scented stuff is going to work. David, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when you're experienced, yeah, any? once you go, once you start going to the organic measures, uh, you know, more natural uh, precautions, such as you know, like you stated, the the peppermint oils. I mean, mm -hmm. they're not going to last long. I mean, it's going to evaporate, right? You're gonna, you're going to need to apply that pretty much morning and night <laughs> for for the, the to even be semi effective. But no, I, they're, they're not, uh, you're going to waste a lot of money and not get the results you're, you're looking for. The only, um, there is a product, I think it's called, I can't remember what it's called, it's made for tractor cabs, but it's a repellent that's made for enclosed spaces. And again, that's that sense is going to fade pretty fast. So excluding them is better. The only way I would use like a repellent, like a smell-based repellent is if I was putting a repellent in to disperse them then closing the hole um so you might like with with um my rat issue now i have this great experience i can talk about <laughs> um i took i have a little uh puffer that puffs uh dust into wall voids i put cayenne pepper in it yeah. i was just pissed because i didn't have any <laughs> any tools on hand so i put cayenne pepper into the to the burrow and then i sealed it up because i was like well maybe you know maybe but <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that. I'm just trying to annoy them. But um, no, they only they're not effective and not effective for very long, just like the the, the ultrasound repellers. Yeah, not at all. And, you know, to go back to the roaches uh, where they're using the raid or anything like that, a lot of times those are pyrethroids and that's a repellent. So what are you going to do to the, the cockroach population? when you're broadband treating with a, with a, with an aerosol like that, you can repel them. So you don't want to repel cockroaches. <laughs> we want them to, to come across products. We want them to, to uh, get into that insect growth regulator. So because they're multi-generational, right? So we want to cut off that reproductive cycle. So it, it doesn't work hand in hand with a, with a, P, a, pro, a professional when, when those are being utilized. Yeah, they can even make it worse. Correct. Any other questions? 
Okay. Do you remember, uh, I just want to make a point, David, do you remember we're talking about, uh, CJ was talking about bats, but uh, David, do you remember one year we had a whole family of raccoons in the app? <laughs> yep. Mother with babies, mother with babies, yeah. No. Wow. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's a professional job too. All these yeah. uh, wildlife yeah. issues, they can carry rabies and we, me and you don't have the technical experience. We could put out a have a heart trap, but. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to wildlife, right? You can't relocate them either. It's, uh, no. you know, it's, it's against the law to relocate. So, you know, when it comes to wildlife like that, you definitely, uh, definitely want to call a professional on that. So feel free to send me other questions as they come up. I'm happy to answer questions and I'll think our next one, Colleen is on bed bugs. I bet we get uh, some interest on that uh, and personal protection. And then we're gonna end with, you know, some strategies to work with clients and I'll show you some more resources and, um, but please feel free to share with me prior to that if you are joining us for the, all the sessions um, some of your questions and issues and we can uh, we can feature those in in the uh, coming okay. sessions and then you're going to be sending me the uh, slides correct uh, Susanna yes and then uh, I've recorded this session so I will upload it to our YouTube site but what I'll do is I'll put everything we'll make sure that Kara Rachel puts it um, on our web page so that you can access it there, either the, both the slides and the link to the YouTube site. All right, and it's uh, revitalizedcdc.com, revitalizedcdc.com. So um, if anybody has any other questions afterwards, feel free to uh, email Susanna. And um, I really appreciate this. This was really a great wealth of information. Uh, I think we all learned a lot. And um, we're looking forward to the next one next Wednesday, the 28th, same time, same place, same location. And if you have poll, <laughs> poll questions again, Suzanne, I'll try to get to make sure that they're separated out next time. Okay, yeah, we can talk about that. Yeah. All right, well, Bye. thank you so much. And thanks for everyone. For, it's a lot of information and quite a long time to listen to somebody drone on. So I appreciate your patience and your listening. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.